Some years ago, my wife and I were faced with a big decision to make, a crossroads in our life. Prior to our marriage, I had worked very hard to get on with a large company where I lived in Florida. They had 15,000 employees. And this company was renowned for job security, for good pay, good benefits retirement and normally when people received a job here this was the only job they ever had in their life so for years I tried to get on with this company and it just so happened that after the diligent perseverance and and finding my way into some corporate offices and asking people long enough and going through all the motions that you have to go through I was accepted in a position in this company and here I thought I was set, my job searches are over. And then I married my wife and we were married for only three or four months when the call came to me that they're laying off 5,000 employees. I was the sixth person to be released from the company. I had only worked there a year and now job search began again. So my wife and I had to make a decision and there was a, a dream that I wanted to pursue. I'd wanted to be a firefighter. So with the support of my wife, we came to the decision that this is the, the career that I would pursue. But that meant putting myself through the fire academy. And with the hard work of my wife, she remained behind and she worked and paid the bills while I went off to the fire academy. This was one of the most uh, prestigious fire academies in the country. So I felt that graduating from this academy would give credibility to my career dream. But I learned many, many valuable lessons while in that fire academy. They would work us very, very hard and the instructors were firm and they tried us and tried us and drilled us and drilled us. And Oftentimes we wondered, why do you have to be so hard? Why does it have to be so rough? And I remember a particular instructor one day when we were waiting for our chance to go be drilled, because we were drilled in teams, we were talking. And he said, you know, I want to tell you something. We're very hard on you because we don't want to see any of you die. What you're trying to do is very serious business. And there's not room for the weak there's not room for the feeble. And there's not room for those who can't make decisions in a moment. There's not room for those. Because he told me he'd been to too many funerals. And he didn't want to have to go to a funeral of one of his students. So I respected that. And I thought, you know, this is, this is a good thing. He really cares about us. That's why he drill, drives us so hard. And as we went through the program... Many of the students packed their bags and went home. As the weeks went by, the class got smaller and smaller and smaller because if you weren't able to handle the drills, if you weren't able to do the test, if you weren't able to physically endure, then you were actually dismissed from the program. Only one or two opportunities of failure did you have when you had to pack and vacate your bunk. And in a way we were sad because the class was getting smaller, but in a way we were happy because there were less people in the dorm room, <laughs> less line at the dinner line. And, but we realized that it was serious. And my experience there, we were not Christians, we were not converted. But when I came to a knowledge of the truth and conversion, I saw many parallels in my experience back there to the Christian walk. The Lord puts us through drills. He tries us because in His work and in the Christian walk, we need to be built up. We need to be strengthened. We need to endure unto the end. And what is the reason that He puts us through all these things? I'm reminded of the verse in Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a verse that I try to remember when I'm feeling tried, when I'm feeling like I'm in difficult situations. Revelation chapter 3 verse 19, it says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. 
Be zealous, therefore, and repent. God is trying us and putting us through a chastening process, isn't He? We know from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, He says that He does it because He loves us as sons, right? In Hebrews chapter 12, we can read there verses 6 through 8. It tells us here, For whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth none? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. God puts us through this process because He loves us. And one thing that He's trying to do is separate the dross from our character, isn't it? He's trying to take the weak traits out of our life so that we could be strong, fitted up for this work. The same is in that fire academy. I remember one incident, they had what we called the maze. It was a room that was pitch black with piping that was only round enough for your body to fit through with the air tank on. And you had to crawl through this maze in total darkness and they had loud noise going and and I remember after that day we all came out of there uh, a little this was early on in the class and we all came out of there going is this what we can expect through the next several months and in there you were never allowed to take the face mask off if for any reason you pulled that mask off you were out dismissed from the program immediately and I remember we all went back to the room and we were young men, so we were a little excited about that and ready to go out tomorrow and do the rest. But the next morning we woke up and there was an empty bunk. One of the students in the night decided that this wasn't for him. And in our class, day in and day out, they were separating the dross from the gold. And in the book of Job, he tells us in chapter 23, verse 10, Job 23 in the 10th verse, you know that Job was enduring a lot of chastening, wasn't he? A lot of trials. But he understood the purpose in Job chapter 23 and verse 10. He said, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. In all of his trials and all of his chastening, Job understood the reason behind them that God was trying to separate the dross from the gold in his life. And Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 7, he says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be fine unto praise and honor and glory, at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Paul here brings out the point that this trying, even though Job said he would come forth as gold, Peter says that it's more valuable than gold. Because the gold on this earth will burn and perish, won't it? But the character that we can perfect in this life will live through eternity. Many feel tried because they don't have gold, don't they? Many are in poverty. They don't have things and they feel like this is a huge trial. But if they understood that this trial is providing something more valuable than gold, they would rejoice. Many look at their financial condition and say, I don't have gold. Woe is me. But God is trying to work something in their life that far exceeds the value of gold. A character fit for eternity. And Peter goes on to mention in the same book, 1 Peter, in chapter 4, <clears throat> verses 12 through 16. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, he says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when His glory shall be revealed, 
ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. We should not think it strange the trial that we're going to endure. And if we understood the purposes for them, we would rejoice, wouldn't we? We would rejoice. But let's talk about trials for a moment. You know, in my studies and in my readings, I've discovered that there's two types of trials. There are trials that God gives you, or God allows to come upon you, and then there are trials that are self-inflicted. Let's look at that for a moment. In 1 Peter, if we go down to the next few verses here, chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, Notice what he says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. So we can see that there's a suffering associated with our wrong course of action, isn't there? But notice in verse 16, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. As I go back to my experiences in the fire academy, I remember there was a, a certain very difficult exercise. They were called hose evolutions that we had to do in a three-story building. And we were divided into teams. And we had heard all the stories. From the day you arrive at the academy, you're looking at the burn building. And then you hear day after day the stories about the burn building. It's a building where they simulate fire. It actually burns in there. And the heat and the smoke and everything are made to assimilate an actual uh, fire environment. And it wasn't that unusual for the uh, fire rescue to actually have to come to the bird building to take out a student who was not able to endure uh, the heat and the smoke. And in fact, on one occasion... A student had died in that building. And day in and day out, we were watching this building. And the building seemed to get taller and taller and bigger and more ominous every day. And the day came that tomorrow you will do hose evolutions. And you can just imagine what was going on in the dorm that evening. What's going to happen? How hot will it be? You know, people have died in that building. What will we do? And the team that I had been assigned to, we made a decision. We sat down and we said, it's 10 o'clock, we need to go to bed. Because if we're going to tackle that building tomorrow, we need to go to sleep. But the other teams decided that they would stay up and fret over the ominous forebodings of tomorrow. And, and I literally, they sat up till late in the night with anxiety and fear of what would happen. And I'm reminded of, of the this, this saying that we always hear, we'll cross that bridge when we get to the river. So we decided that our team would cross the bridge when we got to the river because it would do no good to talk tonight. And the next day, the building was difficult. And it was a test of endurance. But each progressive day they turned up the heat more and they turned up the smoke more and they made it more and more. But the day after the first day in the building we came out and another student had left. And when we sat down that evening over dinner to talk we realized that it was the very student who had the most anxiety over going into the building the next day. And we came to the conclusion that he actually talked himself into being so afraid that he could not continue. And as we look at the trials and things that come upon our life, we have to recognize that a lot of our trials we have brought on ourselves. A lot of them we have magnified into mountains when they were only little bumps in the road. In the book Reflecting Christ, Page 183, notice what it says here. Nine-tenths of the trials and perplexities that so many worry over 
are either imaginary or brought upon themselves by their own wrong course. How many of the trials are brought upon ourselves? The statement here says nine-tenths of our trials we bring upon ourselves. We either blow them out of proportion or we have pursued a wrong course of action to bring that upon ourselves. That means that we suffer many things that God never intended for us to suffer. I found that very profound. And I found myself having to think about what course of action I take now. Because trials are never pleasant, are they? <clears throat> if we notice in Hebrews chapter 12, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, And we'll read verse 11 here, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. It says, Now no chastening for the present seemed joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. No trial seems to be joyous, does it? In fact, it's grievous. But if we learn from our trials, according to this verse, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness, but only unto those who are exercised thereby. If we examine the reason behind our trials, we may find that nine-tenths of them could be avoided. And if we learn from our past mistakes, then we are growing in character, aren't we? But how do some people receive trials? How is it that many receive trials? Many become weary, depressed, despondent. The old famous saying, woe is me, the head hanging down. Why is that? In Proverbs chapter 3 verse 11, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, and verse 11, it says here, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. And notice what the next verse says. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. If we received every trial as from or as the Lord permitting it to happen to teach us something, for us to find wisdom and get understanding, what would we be? Happy. Happy. But yet, so many fall into despondency. I'd like to read from Prophets and Kings, page 164. It says, Hope and courage are essential to perfect service for God. These are the fruit of faith. Despondency is sinful and unreasonable. Notice this sentence. Despondency is sinful. And, and let's just stop here and define what is despondency. Despondency is downcast, depressed, despair, distress, heavy heart, heavy heartedness, sad, unhappy, hopeless. All of this is despondency. When trials come upon us and we begin to feel this way, we're told here that this is sinful. Despondency is sinful and unreasonable. God is able and willing more abundantly to bestow upon His servants the strength they need for test and trial. To feel this way or to come into this state because of our trials means that we lack faith. We lack faith. Because God is able to give us more abundantly the strength we need for test and trial. The statement goes on to say, And this He does in His own time and way, when He sees that the faith of His servants have been sufficiently tested. So, as we were doing those evolutions in the burn building, we knew that day by day they were going to increase the heat. In fact, some, 
some teams of us who are young, and I don't know if we were uh, getting fit or just foolish, but we would come out and ask them to turn it up tomorrow. Because we were getting, our team was working so, so well together that we felt that we could use a little more, you know, that we could get trained a little better. When does God turn up the heat? When we ask Him? When He realizes that we need more heat. And when does He turn down the heat? When He realizes that we have sufficiently passed the test. And I tell you, I can remember the day when they said, you have passed hose evolutions and we don't have to do these anymore. They turned off the heat in that particular drill. And we rejoiced. Because even though we uh, enjoyed learning and doing, it was still a very intense exercise. And God will turn off the heat when He realizes that we have passed. What are some things that we should do? How should we respond to trials that God gives us? In Steps to Christ, page 119, one of the first things we need to do is not do what that young man did in the academy and sit up, sit and talk and talk and talk about the huge trial that's upon me or is coming. In Steps to Christ, page 119, it says, All have trials, griefs hard to bear, temptations hard to resist. Do not tell your troubles to your fellow mortals, but carry everything to God in prayer. Make it a rule never to utter one word of doubt or discouragement. Notice this. We often pick up the phone and we want to share the burden of our heart with others. And those of you who are in the work, especially here in the Roanoke area, you often hear many trials and troubles. And I know in local churches we hear, and it starts to feel like you're carrying everybody's trials and troubles. And often we don't stop to consider that the minister has his own trials and troubles and griefs to bear. Amen. But notice the statement here said, make it a rule to never do what? Never utter one word of doubt or discouragement. Because you just add to the trials of others. You can do much to brighten the life of others and strengthen their efforts by words of hope and holy cheer. So step number one. Let's not brood over our trials. Take them to Jesus. Give them to Him. We read the statement that He is able to give us more abundantly the strength that we need to endure our trials and temptations. Another word of, of instruction comes to us in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 12. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 12. Speaking about chastening, verse 11 speaks of chastening. And verse 12 says, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. In other words, lift your head up. Don't talk doubt and discouragement. In the next verse it says, And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. So first, we don't talk about the doubt and discouragement. And secondly, we correct our wrongs. Make straight paths for your feet. Try to understand. Come to God and ask Him, what is it you're trying to teach me with this trial? That I may correct it and make straight paths for my feet. And then what must we do? In Councils on Health, page 629, it says, Despondent feelings are frequently the result of too much leisure. The, the hands and mind should be occupied in useful labor, labor, lightening the burdens of others. And those who are thus employed will be benefited themselves also. Idleness gives time to brood over imaginary sorrows. 
And frequently, those who do not have real hardships and trials will borrow them from the future. So this statement tells us that we need to get busy. Do work, useful labor for the Lord, and you will be benefited. You will come in contact with others and realize that your trials are minuscule. Your difficulties are inconsequential compared to the needs of others. As we examine these points, we have to consider that we have an enemy that's as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may destroy. And as you, if you study nature and you realize that the lions don't go after the healthy, do they? When the lion looks at a herd of zebra or a gazelle or whatever it may be, the first thing he does is pick out the weak, pick out the feeble. And Satan is the same. He tries us and tests us, but if we're strong, he cannot succeed. So just like the lion will run against the herd to get everybody moving, get all the animals moving and to see which animal is the one he will pick to turn up the heat upon. And then he will single out that animal and chase and chase and chase. And Satan does the same with us. He looks for us and he tests us. And the weakest, those who are falling into these feelings of despondency, despair over their trials and their temptations, are the very ones that he begins to attack more. In Prophets and Kings, page 174, it says, It is at the time of greatest weakness that Satan assails the soul with the fiercest temptations. And if we look over biblical history, we see we have men that were firm, but in their time of weakness, Satan was able to gain a foothold. A few that come to mind are Moses, a man of strong character, a man who was doing the work of God, but a man who under the pressure and test of the multitude, when he was at his weakest point, he fell. The statement goes on to say, it says, Moses, wearied with 40 years of wandering and unbelief, lost for a moment his hold on infinite power. It was the unbelief of the people constantly being told to him over and over and over that weakened him and in a moment he committed that sin that kept him out of the promised land. It says he failed just on the borders of the promised land. So with Elijah, he who had maintained his trust in Jehovah during the years of drought and famine, who had stood on, undaunted before Ahab, he who throughout the trying day on Carmel had stood before the whole nation of Israel, the sole witness to the true God, in a moment of weariness allowed the fear of death to overcome his faith in God. Brethren, we need to examine these situations and realize that when test and trial comes, we cannot afford to move into despondency, despair, hopelessness. We cannot afford to speak words of doubt and discouragement. We cannot afford to cease our labors for those in need. Because Satan will recognize that weakness. The statement goes on in Prophets and Kings 174. It says, And so it is today. When we are encompassed with doubt, perplexed by circumstances, or afflicted by poverty or distress, Satan seeks to shake our confidence in Jehovah. It is then that he arrays before us our mistakes and tempts us to distrust God, to question His love. He hopes to discourage the soul and break our hold on God. We can contrast this experience with the experience of Job. The fiercest trials and temptations came upon him. Temptation to renounce God. Temptation to not stand for the right amidst horrible affliction. But yet, he stood firm. Why? Because as we read, Job recognized the reason behind his trial. 
He recognized what God was trying to do. And he said, as after he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. But not only that example, we have the most wonderful example of Christ Himself. Christ endured all the temptation that we could. But it is written of Him that He would never fail or become discouraged. Let's read that verse in Isaiah chapter 42. In the book of Isaiah chapter 42, in the fourth verse. Notice what it says here. It says, He shall not fail nor be discouraged till He have set judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for His law. He shall not fail or be discouraged. In fact, in our opening text, I find much encouragement out of the account in Luke chapter 13, verses 31 through 33. With such great temptation about him, such trial in his life, <clears throat> even with men intent on killing him, what did Christ come back with? What was his testimony? Luke chapter 13, verses 31 through 33. It says, The same day there came certain of the Pharisees, saying unto him, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils and do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Was he undaunted in his mission? No. In fact, in the next verse, what does he say? Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Christ said, It cannot be that I have to go. I have a work to do that must be accomplished. It cannot be. In Gospel Workers, chapter 40, page 42, Gospel Workers, page 42, it says, Jesus carried the awful weight of responsibility for the salvation of men. Why is it that Christ could not go out of Jerusalem? Why is it? He had a mission. And nothing was going to deter Him from that mission. It says that this was the burden of His soul. Through childhood, youth, and manhood, He walked alone. Yet it was heaven to be in His presence. Day by day, He met trials and temptations. Day by day, He was brought into contact with evil and witnessed its power upon those whom He was seeking to bless and save. Yet He did not fail nor become discouraged. Day after day. Not only the, own, the temptations that were His own, but He bore the trial and temptations of all men. And every man He came in contact with, He felt in His own soul the pain and sorrow that they felt in theirs. Yet He never once talked doubt. He never once felt discouragement. What drove him? What drove him? He had a mission. And I remember in that burn building, when we used to go in there, we went in there with a mission. And we were taught very early that you, if you leave that building without one of your teammates, you go home. No matter what it takes, you bring your crew out. And we had a mission. Among us, we said, I will never leave you there. And on occasion, we had to pull, to help one another out of the building. And I remember one time, my, my air was almost exhausted, my bell was ringing, and I had to get out of the building. But I always remembered what we said together, that we would not leave any of us in that building. And I quickly ran, and, and I found the rest of the crew and they heard my bell and they dropped everything and carried me out of the building. That was the only time we didn't finish our evolution. 
And I still believe the tank wasn't all the way full. But God had this, Jesus had this same kind of mission, didn't He? He wasn't going to leave here until He had completed His mission. And I believe that we need to have, be driven to our mission. In Isaiah chapter 53, He didn't look at the task that was before Him. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 11. He looked at the result that His work would bring. In Isaiah 53, verse 11, it says, He shall see the travail of His soul and shall be satisfied. By His knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for He shall bear their iniquities. He didn't look upon what He saw today. He worked for what He would see in the future. He was driven by a mission. In Gospel Workers, page 28, it says, His earthly pilgrimage was cheered by the thought that He would not have all this travail for naught, but would win man back to loyalty to God. And there are triumphs yet to be accomplished through the blood shed for the world that will bring everlasting glory to God and to the Lamb. The heathen will be given for his inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for his possession. Christ will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Brethren, as we look around and we see trials and we see temptations and we see things that are painful to us and to one another, we don't have time to brood over them and examine them and talk about them. We need to be driven by a mission. In Review and Herald, January 27th, 1903, it says, As our people engage in earnest work for the Master, complaints will cease to be heard. Many will be roused from the despondency that is ruining them body and soul. As they work for others, they will have much that is helpful to speak of when they assemble to worship God. The testimonies they bear will not be dark and gloomy, but full of joy and courage. Instead of thinking and talking about the faults of their brethren and sisters and about their own trials, they will think and talk of the love of Christ and will strive earnestly to become more efficient workers for Him. Brethren, we need to get up and work. We need to see a mission before us. And we need to say like Christ, it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. You know, often where I have been, I've asked the question, why me? What if I just stop and go back to my other life, out of the work? But the thought has always come to my mind, who will do it? Who will carry on the mission? It's not that I'm indispensable. And it's not that God will not bring others. But we have to realize that there's a work for every one of us to do. And if I move out of my place, can I expect someone to take up a work that I was not willing to do myself? Christ said, it cannot be that the prophet departeth out of Jerusalem. It was necessary for the plan of salvation that he remain there. And it's necessary for us to find our place and fulfill our mission. In Romans chapter 12, we have some, some well-known verses here. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Many of us are very familiar with these texts. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We need this renewing of mind, brethren. We need to present our bodies a living sacrifice. Not to brood over our problems and our trials and our difficulties, but to say, here I am, send me. 
What is my mission, Lord? Give it to me. I give my body. And He says, I'll turn up the heat because I need to get that body in shape to go put out the fires that I have for you. To go save the souls that are in those buildings. And I remember the drills we had, the rescue drills too. The building had the same intensity, but now you don't have a fire hose with you. Because if you know, you can cool things down. You dissipate heat with steam and so forth. But when we had to do the, re the rescue drills, you didn't have that option. And your key, the key was to stay as close, crawling on your stomach across the floor. And they actually put on one of your teammates in there as the victim. You had to actually find them, pick them up, and carry them out. But I remember in their wisdom, we didn't do those exercises till we had finished hose evolutions, tanker fires, all of these other drills that fit us to be able to do that. And God wants to do the same with us. In Signs of the Times, February 3rd, 1888, it says, When we are renewed in the spirit of our minds, we shall have no disposition to murmur at our lot. The praise of God will be welling up in our hearts continually. The solemn responsibility that, that God has laid upon us for the salvation of souls will absorb our whole heart and mind and we shall have no time to talk of our trials and sacrifices. Oh, we must wash our robes of character from every stain in the blood of the Lamb and prepare for the great day of God. It says in this verse that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? The salvation of souls. When our hearts and minds are renewed, when we have this experience, when we're driven by a mission, not only will we be saved, but we may prove what is the will of God that other souls may be saved. Today, you and I are being tested. God is testing us just now, testing us to see if we will work, to see if we're capable of working, to fit us up for work. In the book, Lift Him Up, page 249, it says, The bright and cheerful side of religion will be represented by all who are daily consecrated to God. We should not dishonor our Lord by a mournful relation of trials that appear grievous. All trials that are received as educators will produce joy. All trials. How many? All. All, all that are what? Received as educators. But all that are received as curses will do what? Produce discouragement, despondency. In volume 4, Testimonies for the Church, page 217, it says, God has been testing and proving you. How have you borne the test? You needed to be planed and polished to have the rough and jagged points of your character removed, that you might become refined for the kingdom of heaven. How hard it is for human nature to deny, deny inclination. How hard for men to leave flattering worldly inducements and through love of their Savior and their fellow men to deny their own pleasure in order to engage more directly in the service of God. God is testing to see if we're willing to do this. If we're willing. And when we work, we will see more joy. Why? When we pass the test, we will have joy. Why will we have so much joy? Notice Luke chapter 15 and verse 7. In Luke chapter 15 and verse 7 it says, I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons who need no repentance. Where will the greatest joy come to us? When we are in heaven. When we see the souls that were brought to the love for the Savior through our instrumentality. And brethren, even in this life you can have that joy. 
When you see souls give their life to Jesus Christ, and then the greatest joy for me is even found when they give their life to work for Him also. Then that is the mission that we should be driven by. I don't look at the horrible state of things. I look at what that soul can become if I just work hard enough for them by the grace of God. We need to be driven like Christ was driven. We need to be driven to go into the burning buildings, to go in and rescue those souls who are in the smoke and the miasma of the sins of this world, who need to be dragged out of there, who need to be brought to fresh air and sunshine of God's love, who need the healing that He can bring. In Review and Herald, March 25, 1880, it says, Not all are called to preach the Word, but there are other ways in which we may be of service in the cause of God. Many feel themselves excused from doing anything because they cannot stand in the desk and explain the truths of the Gospel. But let us consider, dear friends, what joy unspeakable will fill our hearts in the day of God if, as we gather around the great white throne, we shall see souls saved through our instrumentality. With the crown of immortal glory upon their brows, how shall we feel as we look upon that company and see one soul saved through our agency who has saved others and these still others? A large assembly brought into the haven of rest as the result of our labors there to lay their crowns at Jesus' feet and to praise Him with immortal tongues throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. I'm reminded of the experience of how I came into the message. It was an elderly man who lived over 350 miles away received a camp meeting invitation in a mailbox one day. And that brother said, this, there is something to this message. And he gave himself and he joined the church. And the next thing you know, 350 miles away, there were 28 souls separating and joining God's church. Amen. That man in his 80s said, what missionary work can I do? What can I do for the Lord? And by God's grace, if we all endure unto the end, he'll be able to stand on the sea of glass and see 28 souls by His instrumentality. There's a work that we all can do. And there's a work that we all need to do. So brethren, let us have the mind of Christ. Let us work with a mission, with purpose, with a goal in mind. Set yourself a goal and say, I'm going to do something for the Lord. Set the goal, whatever it may be. Receive the trials that He brings your way as educators and examine your path of life so that you don't bring unnecessary trials upon yourself and leave yourself open prey for the enemy. But always remember the verses in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. Wherefore, seeing, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Let us run the race with a mission like Christ. And let us say ourselves that it cannot be that the prophet perisheth out of Jerusalem. 
It's my wish and prayer that each one of us will run the race, not looking at the rocky road we have before us, but the mission that we have to fulfill, the goal that we're working for. And by God's grace, and by union with Him who's able to give us all strength to overcome all temptation and all trial, we shall endure unto the end.